start recording. Oops. I'll wake everybody up. And then uh, we'll get it rolling. <coughs> All right, looks like we got a good, strong audio. <clears throat> All right, go ahead, get started, pull up the questions. <clears throat> All right. Good morning, everybody, and uh, live from the Midfield Cafe here at Boarfield, National, New Hampshire. I'm Len Costa with the PilotReport.tv. Today, I'm joined with Dave Pasco of LiveATC.net. Good to have you on today, Dave. Good to be here, Len. So uh, I've gotten an opportunity to meet Dave a few months ago at one of the uh, UCAP meetups, actually, here at the Midfield Cafe, and uh, we had started um, talking a little bit. I saw I met up with him at Oshkosh for, uh, once or twice. And uh, I was actually in the area this week, and I decided, uh, you know, I'd, I'd see if he was available to sit down and uh, do a quick interview and tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, how he came up with the idea for Live ATC. And uh, I've even fielded a few questions from the folks out on Twitter, and we'll be answering those as well today live on the air. So, uh, again, this is Dave Pasco with LiveATC.net. Um, I first actually downloaded your your iPhone application just a few months ago um, when I was out plane spotting and I was at the I was at the Washington Reagan Airport sitting at the approach end of the river visual with my camera and I'm trying to figure out one of these airplanes coming in and you know I'm like there's a better way for this and I I remembered liveatc.net I downloaded the application I got the earbuds in the phone in my pocket and I'm out there with my big zoom lens <laughs> you know catching some photos so it was an interesting use as the first time I've actually uh, used the service via the telephone, but uh, it was very handy. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got started in aviation or flying? Sure. I've uh, always been interested in aviation. I um, didn't get started until uh, around 2001. Uh, had gotten a chance a few years before that to go on a uh, small plane. It was my first uh, flight in a small mm -hmm. plane, and uh, it then became you know, a little more apparent and then some encouraging from friends uh, that, uh, you know, gee, I could do this. And uh, began my training in 01, got my private that year, and then uh, not too long after that started my instrument training, and the uh, year after that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, got my instrument rating. Okay. I've got all the, um, I've got about uh, over uh, 600 hours. I've got um, all the requirements done for my commercial, all right. except for the check ride and the written. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, uh, I keep lollygagging on that. I've been doing that for about the last three or four years. Okay. But I am, I am determined that uh, this, this winter or <coughs> spring I'm going to do that, and then uh, next summer I intend to uh, go work on my CFI. Great. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So I, I did some poking around the website a little bit more to see... Uh, what you've got out there, and uh, looks like you started the website somewhere around 2003 time frame, mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> you were talking about how the idea was to share the live air traffic control feed from Boston Logan, uh, Boston Logan Tower. Mm -hmm. there, was that actually, you know, the very the very first feed that you had out? It was. It was the very first feed. My brother uh, actually uh, uh, lived uh, down in, in that area, about six miles from Logan. Uh, at the time, I was really interested in. Uh, air traffic control procedures and especially around busy airspace. Mm -hmm. I had always sort of, you know, listened a little bit on scanner radios back to when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, but I got particularly interested in the detailed procedures that they use to, you know, vector aircraft into the airport and departures. And at the time, I was involved with a uh, network called VATSIM, mm -hmm. uh, which is a virtual flying network and controlling network. And I was involved uh, mostly as an air traffic, as a virtual air traffic controller. So I was sort of, you know, really desperate to learn the real world procedures because mm -hmm. the VATSIM motto is as real as it gets. And so those of us who were, you know, pretty serious about it um, really wanted to know, you know, what was going on. So I set up a couple receivers down there. I knew a lot about audio streaming and, mm -hmm. um, you know, internet technology and uh, put it out there mm -hmm. and uh, didn't really think, you know, anybody else would really be interested. But I thought, well, you know, why keep it to myself? Let's let some other folks listen in. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know people started writing in from 
you know, New York and California and sort of all over the world saying, you know, hey, I'd like to do that too. And mm -hmm. I've got a receiver and it's, you know, kind of sitting around, you know, not really doing much. And I'd like to share uh, what I can hear with the world. Right. So, and just kind of grew organically from there. Well, that's cool. Um, so do you, do you recall what your, you know, maybe the next few feeds were after that? The next, started with Boston. Yeah, and started with Boston, and then um, memory's a little bit fuzzy, but I know we had JFK on there okay. uh, not too long after that. Uh, there was a lot of demand, obviously, for that. Very busy international <laughs> airport, uh, international audience. And I think to this day, uh, that and some of the international feeds, like uh, Turkey is very popular, mm -hmm. uh, Istanbul. Uh, but, you know, all of them are popular in their own right. Okay. Um, but, yeah, JFK and then uh, probably Philadelphia was not long after mm -hmm. that. And then there were a whole bunch of... Um, feeds here in New England because mm -hmm. of my, you know, the fact that I live here and the fact right. that I can go easily set up receivers. So you'll see, you know, back in the early days, you'll see a high density of receivers right around the Boston area and the New England mm -hmm. states and, you know, pretty much down to New York through Connecticut and so forth. Okay. Now you actually, before we sat down, uh, we're mentioning that you just came back from JFK to, to fix a feed. Is it common for you to go personally to some of these legacy or, you know, more popular feed areas and, and work on them? It is. The, the busier feeds are uh, typically systems that are, uh, the big feeds anyway, where you see lots of channels at an airport. They're typically set up by Live ATC, by mm -hmm. myself. And they're, they're small systems that are put together, special systems that can handle up to, you know, eight to ten receivers. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not common to have to actually go out and fix things because things are kind of designed and built mm -hmm. uh, to be pretty reliable. Uh, we use, uh, you know, it's commodity computing hardware to encode the streams, but it's Linux operating system and pretty reliable hardware. So it, it, it isn't typical, but, you know, occasionally things fail. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, feeds go down from time to time. People wonder a lot about that. Right. Um, and it can be for any number of reasons. You know, the uh, most of these feeds are on uh, consumer Internet connections mm -hmm. uh, and Internet providers. You know, they're great most of the time. But some of them just go down from time to time. Right. Uh, so, so that sort of stuff happens. But luckily, I don't have to do a whole lot of that. And uh, many of the feeds, though, or the majority of the feeds, are actually run by volunteers who okay. help by you know taking care of their own scanner, mm -hmm. their own computer, and we try to make things as easy to set up as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Yeah, because I've got actually a couple of questions from the folks on Twitter uh, later on, that sort of along the lines of the volunteering. How do they set do it up? Do equipment. Uh, so we'll get on to that in, um, a little bit later on. Now, you know, the website's grown. It's 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 a lot of people know about it, uh, especially in our sort of Twitter circle and social media circle. But you know, when you first got started, how long? Did it really take for the, the website to, you know, sort of take traction or become fairly popular? It sounds like it was kind of an, almost an instant hit, but I'm not sure if that's really yeah. the way it went down. At, at some level, I mean, it, it was it was very popular, but again, in, in mainly in the aviation circle mm -hmm. and in the the aviation geek uh, or av geek circle. Uh, but you know, it did it did take a year or two for it to get um, the kind of traction we have now, mm -hmm. um, and it's steadily grown since then. Mm -hmm. So. It does take time. I mean, any site takes time. Although it is, it's a unique thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is, uh, you know, there's really nothing quite like it that's really focused right. on that. You know, there are other scanner sites and receiver mm -hmm. sites where people can listen to a variety of things. But mm -hmm. you know, my sole interest is aviation, right? In terms of this activity, and so you know, that's our obsession and focus. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Tell me a little bit, um, you know, how did you ever involve in air traffic control or is this sort of just a hobby that you developed into the website? Do you have any background in air traffic control besides, you know, being a pilot? Uh, besides being a pilot and reading the 7110, uh, you know, <laughs> more or less back to back when I was doing my VAT sim training, uh, no formal training. Okay. Um, but just uh, just a, an intense uh, interest in, in what they do. I've always had... Uh, I've always found it kind of fascinating. Um, I'm an engineer uh, by background, and so, you know, always kind of wondering about how things work, mm -hmm. and I've always wondered how they do what they do. You know, I understand a lot about radar. I know a lot about the radio technology and the radar technology in, in fairly good detail, but the operational aspect of air traffic control and, and how they kind of keep it all together mm -hmm. and coordinate uh, between facilities and within facilities, that's always been fascinating to me. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just mainly a, a hobby interest. Very neat. Uh, so, getting a little bit more on the technical aspect, how does the website work behind the scenes? We'll start sort of explaining 
I guess just you know you, you've got a scanner mm -hmm. and you said it's sort of uh, it's it's hooked up sometimes through a consumer internet connection. Yeah. Um, what else, what can you explain about the actual process? So this is uh, an example of um, a scan a typical scanner that we'll use in a lot of these setups. That's a a Bearcat scanner, but any, any scanner that can actually pick up uh, aviation communications can be used. So the way it works is you know we take a scanner or uh, several of them and we hook it up through um, an audio cable to uh, a PC sound card. Mm -hmm. at, at the very simplest level with one scanner and one computer there's an audio cable from the scanner to the computer and then there's some encoding software. Very similar to how we're broadcasting here uh, today on Ustream mm -hmm. uh, but it's a very simple program and it's of course audio only so that sends the signal, the audio signal to the website and then we have a distribution mechanism that's uh, home built that distributes that audio to listeners. Okay. So and we can scale up to you know tens of thousands of listeners. So um, we very seldom get that many, except in a in a surge of activity mm -hmm. around a, a big event that is well publicized. But mm -hmm. uh, typically, you know, we'll get uh, in the neighborhood of you know two to three to four thousand listeners. Now uh, peak. Okay. Uh, so. And you've got, I guess, you've got your own servers and stuff that handles all this traffic. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's pretty cool. And in, in your background in engineering, did you sort of did you do any work like this previously, or you, again from the hobby and the desire, you learned it, you implemented it, and that's basically how it came about? Yeah, my back. I have a background in, in IT, so okay. I, I've got an oper you know an operations background and, and some somewhat of a development background. Um, so yeah, I've got a lot of uh, experience with streaming audio and, and servers and scaling and okay. networking and, and all that sort of stuff. So so that that part made it very easy. Uh, years ago, uh, the thing that also kind of inspired me was years ago, um, the, uh, I think it was the uh, city like SUNY Brooklyn, mm -hmm. City University of New York Brooklyn had a real audio feed of JFK Tower, mm -hmm. and the reception weren't wasn't very good. This kind of goes also back to the roots of Live ATC. The reception wasn't very great, and there were only 10 listeners who could listen mm -hmm. on a given day. This is the very uh, early days of the internet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to get on there every day and you know try to get one of those 10 slots so I could, so I could hang <laughs> on to it and, and hog it for the whole day. Um, and I said, geez, you know, with technology today, we could do much better than this, mm -hmm. obviously. And, but that was also an early uh, inspiration besides all the VATSIM stuff and the flying stuff. Okay. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, I did field a few questions from some folks on Twitter, and uh, we'll go ahead and jump onto that section from um, from Jay Talman, 1959. She wanted to know. Um, well, we sort of covered the first part of the question, how you got the idea, but she she wanted to know if you realize how helpful LiveATC.net has become for pilots and flight training. Yeah, and this was. You know, one of this wasn't one of the early intentions, uh, but but pretty early on when we uh, figured out how to archive the audio and make it available for uh, uh, download after mm -hmm. you know after the broadcast, um, it also became apparent in my training and talking to people that that's what it was starting to be used mm -hmm. for. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that are kind of cool and, and interesting and useful that don't always happen by design, mm -hmm. and this this training aspect is actually one of them. Uh, but today, it actually is one of the main uh, reasons and one of the ways that we're able to actually expand the network is we work with a lot of flight schools, mm -hmm. FBOs, um, and you know people who are CFIs mm -hmm. uh, who are involved in flight training. And part of the reason that they broadcast their local airport is so they can get those archives and that students right. can go back and you know critique their radio skills and. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually learn something because it's very hard to learn I mean as you know right very hard to learn that sort of thing in the cockpit mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I've seen in being around flight training for the longest time is you can teach almost anybody how to fly uh, but teach them how to talk in the radio and, mm -hmm. and interact with air traffic controllers and not be afraid of them and work with them very hard thing to do mm -hmm. I'm sure you share I'm sure you've seen that in your right. travels as well well it's interesting and I don't really know where the where the fear uh, comes from, but there there definitely is that that radio fear when when somebody is getting started, mm -hmm. and uh, the having access to this resource and uh, fo fo folks to sit and just listen to other people communicate, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's almost like learning English all over again, like from when from your young child. So it's, uh, it's it's quite helpful in that manner. It's yeah, very neat. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, gentlemen, uh, Bill wrote wanted to know. 
how can we get more airports added to live ATC? Uh, and I think that sort of stems into the volunteer aspect. Yeah, um, it's one of the biggest questions that, that comes up all the time is why isn't my airport on there or, you know, why isn't right. um, Atlanta Hartsfield, you know, one of the busiest airports in the world on there? And, uh, you know, the simple matter is it, it we do a lot of work to try to get receivers mm -hmm. placed near busy airports. Okay. Um, but we're happy to put any airport uh, on the air and mm -hmm. help, or help get that to happen. Um, and the reason is it just takes time. Uh, it takes finding volunteers, getting them set up, uh, and then you know setting them up in a way that uh, actually makes the reception and the feed right. as right. reliable as possible. Uh, there's a lot of feeds that go up that you know go down shortly thereafter or go mm -hmm. down a lot because you know for a variety of technical reasons things fail uh, or they weren't set up right in the first place. So we tr there's actually a lot of work that we do to help okay. people set up. So so the reason is it takes time and you know the best thing you can do is to find. Um, a flight school or a, an FBO at your mm -hmm. airport and send them to us and we'll work with them to get the airport online. Would that be more helpful just because of their approximate location? You it know, is. To like, yeah. For instance, it's better to have a, a receiver here at the airport because you'll get air traffic control and pilots versus, you know, if I live 10 miles away, line of sight, I might not get the tower communications. Yeah, exactly. If you're, if you're near the airport, like within, uh, let's say, you know, five to 10 miles is a pretty good average range. If mm -hmm. you're higher than the airport, you're going to get much better right. reception. Uh, but it's generally better to be at the airport environment. Okay. Sometimes you don't want to be too close to the tower, but because, uh, you know, the receivers can be overloaded. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're on the airport property, that's generally the best place. Uh, the critical thing is um, it'd be it's really good to get an antenna outside because not only can you pick up the air traffic control transmissions better, but mm -hmm. you can hear all the airplanes even as they're, say, you know, 10 or 15 miles out. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're in a hangar, for example, with a lot of metal around right. you, it's not going to be very good. It's like a Faraday cage. So generally you want to either have an antenna, you know, on the back of the uh, scanner set, there are antennas that just stick up from the mm -hmm. back, place near a window is usually a good thing, or have an antenna outside. And, you know, we help uh, point people to the right technology okay. to do that. It's very inexpensive, though. You know, antennas typically like thirty-five or forty dollars, okay. and scanners can be had for as little as fifty dollars. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Bill also went on to further ask. Um, his question was, "How can we improve the audio for the ones that are already up?" Um, and I know I, I yeah. think one of the. I'm not sure if one of your driving reasons is to keep it simple and low bandwidth. I don't know if that affects it, but maybe you could elaborate on that. Sure. Yeah, the bandwidth actually has very little effect on it because okay. it's, it's just spoken word. Um, the reason we keep the bandwidth relatively low, we set it at the, the uh, sort of the optimum place to be able to service mobile phones, mm -hmm. which j don't always have access to a lot of bandwidth. Right. Uh, we broadcast at 16 kilobits per second. Um, which is kind of just about the right spot to not have any voice degradation mm -hmm. uh, and to you know work with a variety of clients. But the quality issue can be one of two things. It could be either the signal is not very good, and mm -hmm. that might be that the, the particular receiving site is not close to the airport, right. or it could be that there is something misadjusted, uh, like the volume is too loud mm -hmm. on the scanner or on the computer. Uh, so let us know, right? Because um, you know with over 650 feeds. We don't always have the ability to monitor every single one. Mm -hmm. We do check them before they go on the air, mm -hmm. so that's why sometimes feed doesn't go live immediately. Right, right. So we check the audio, but things can happen. Mm -hmm. You know, kids bump volume knobs. Right. There's all sorts of like crazy <laughs> things that happen. So just let us know, and we look into it. Okay, great. Um, from Social Arrow, is it possible for Live ATC to build a player? that lets us annotate the stream to easily save and note interesting moments. We're looking at that feature. Um, there are a number of issues because when we do things, now that we have an Android app as well, mm -hmm. we like to do them on, on both platforms. Right. And for the people who are looking for other platforms, we are working and, and looking at some of the other mobile platforms. But um, that's a feature that's on the feature list. Uh, don't have a release date, but it is under consideration. Okay. But I, I can't. I can't talk about release dates or anything. No but problem. it is a cool idea, and a lot of people want to do that. Okay. Very cool. Um, from Wired, Wired for Flight. Uh, now we're really getting into the technical details. How can I set up a feed, and is there a list of hardware that you recommend? There is, and uh, the best thing to do is just to contact us through the contact. Form. We generally like to interact with people who want to volunteer mm -hmm. kind of on a one-on-one -on -one basis. We'll be putting a lot more of that stuff out there, um, doing a, a bit of a website redesign, and so okay. a lot more information is going to go out there. But best thing to do is contact us. 
we'll give you all the information and help you along. Wonderful. Um, from somebody you're probably familiar with, I would gather, uh, SNF Radio Dave, <laughs> what's in store for Sun and Fun 2012? <laughs> Well, Dave, all the great stuff that we had for <laughs> SNF Radio 11, um, and uh, maybe uh, maybe a couple of surprises. Were, uh, one of the things that we did last year that uh, we thought was pretty cool was um, on the uh, the military formation flights. Mm -hmm. I can't remember if it was Blue Angels or who we had, but we had uh, the audio mixed in with SNF Radio uh, with the narration. So we had the eight, you know the, the air to air communication between the pilots mixed in with the narration. Which actually worked out to be really kind of cool, mm -hmm. and it was a very impromptu thing that we just set up uh, while we were there. So, so we'll probably do that again, mm -hmm. and uh, who knows what else? Cool. Uh, from Aviation Times, are there any countries with legislation prohibiting transmission of air traffic control communications? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there there are there are several. Um, the UK is a notable one. Mm -hmm. uh, New Zealand is a notable one. That's why uh, you won't see any. Uh, any broadcast from those places, even though we're not subject to those laws, um, because we operate here, um, mm -hmm. sit, you know, any citizen who would be broadcasting would be in violation. Right. Of right. In fact, in the UK, it's even worse. You're not even allowed to listen uh, by yourself, let alone broadcast. Yet, uh, plane spotting is a, a crazy popular activity it is, in the UK. It's very much. And every time you go to a UK airport, you see them sitting there with the radios. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those for personal use, even though it's against the law. Uh, it's not enforced, but streaming, they do take a dim view of it, mm -hmm. um, you know, which we're working actually with uh, with them to try to get it uh, sanctioned as, as an okay activity uh, or an exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very difficult process. It's going to be, it's going to take some time, but essentially it, you know, because it's become such an educational activity mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of pilots who uh, are training to, you know, fly internationally. Uh, there's a lot of value in actually having access to be able to listen to you know approaches happening at Heathrow, for mm -hmm. example. So we're hopeful that that'll that'll get approved. But it's again, it's a very lengthy, time-consuming process. Do you know that kind of brings up my own question? Um, I really only listen to the feeds in the U.S. But uh, off the top of your head, roughly how many countries outside of the U.S. you may be involved in? You said about 650 feeds total. Yeah, it's about 650 feeds, which represent you know somewhere over. Uh, 450 or so, or 475 airports. Mm -hmm. um, as far as international, we've got you know, a fair number in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got uh, a sprinkling of them in Asia. Okay. Um, but you know, the in South America is very strong. Uh, we've got a number in Australia. So, uh, but the bulk are in the U.S. and Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are you know quite a number uh, of international. Or, you know other locations and that's growing actually mm -hmm. that's growing probably at the same or greater rate than feeds coming up in the US mm -hmm. so you don't I guess there's it sounds like there's only really just a, a couple maybe countries that have these restrictions yeah there's just there's just it's a very it's a fairly small number okay and of the and of the other ones that may okay. exist um, you know they're they're not enforced but, mm -hmm. you know, we generally take a pretty conservative view uh, that may not always be true um, it really depends on um, what we can learn about mm -hmm. what they really feel about the law. You know, right. there, there are laws on the books that are just never going to be enforced. Right. And you know, if you can get a sanction from an aviation authority, mm -hmm. um, you know, and we, we want to do it officially. We'd like to do it you know, so that they actually right. understand the value. And we're not trying to do something, you know, uh, surreptitious and mm -hmm. you know, because I mean, it's out there, so they'll see it. And, right. And it, <laughs> yeah. it, it just wastes a lot of time for everybody to put the feeds. Up. And we've had to do that in the past. We put feeds up in the UK, and then mm -hmm. you know, somebody rats them out, and, and they disappear. And then people, right. people get confused, like, "Well, it was there yesterday. Why isn't it there now?" So mm -hmm. we just—that's why we adopted the stance of just don't do it. Just don't do it. Yeah, that's probably safer too. Yeah. Uh, tell us, are there any little-known functions or areas of the website that uh, you wish visitors knew a little bit more about? Yeah, the, a lot of this will take, be taken care of in the redesign. It's mm -hmm. actually, um, you know, through spending a lot of time focusing on feeds and all of that, the website um, hasn't developed as quickly and, you know, there's a lot of, you know, some layout issues mm -hmm. and, and things that um, will definitely be better with the redesign. But some of the uh, things that people aren't probably aware of is you can search for a frequency mm -hmm. um, on the left hand side navigation bar there's a, a box to be able to punch a frequency so if okay. you know your local frequency but you're not sure of the airport code you can do that 
Um, and then the archives, a lot of people um, don't realize that they're there. Uh, so uh, you can go to the archives, pull up any airport. You have to know the time in, in GMT, mm -hmm. but you pull that up and uh, you can pull up any recording. Uh, occasionally, one of the questions that comes up a lot is, well, you know, I tried to pull up 2.30 p.m. yesterday and the recording's missing. Why did you take it away or why didn't it happen? Mm -hmm. There's a variety of technical issues uh, that mean sometimes that recordings aren't available. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is that the feed went down even for a brief period of time during right. that recording. Okay. Uh, but uh, other than that, you know, they're pretty highly reliable and highly available. Uh, speaking of the Android application, you also have a uh, iOS app for the iPhone. And yep. does, is it iPad compatible? I haven't used it on my iPad. It's iPad compatible. It's not optimized for the iPad, okay. but uh, there's going to be a uh, an iPad specific version that's okay. going to be coming out, and uh, it's probably uh, we're looking at you know, probably Q1 of next year, but uh, mm -hmm. there's no guarantee of that. We're actually trying to figure out. Uh, what other functionality we want in there? Sure. Uh, besides the feeds, and, sure. Uh, but it will be uh, it will be out. Okay, and we already sort of touched upon the uh, the redesign of the website. But what other future um, future plans and expansions are you able to you know share with us today? Well, the mo you know the the biggest thing is getting uh, filling in the feeds that are missing, mm -hmm. you know, the ones that um, you know, we think have a lot of value. Um, big training airports, uh, airports, you know, little you know, Class D or uh, even uncontrolled fields mm -hmm. that are areas of heavy training activity. We're trying to get a lot of those uh, on, on Atlanta. Uh, we expect to have Atlanta online uh, with, you know, as good a coverage as we have at, at JFK uh, by um, early next year. Um, so it, there's a lot of focus around the feed activities, but there will be enhancements that will be coming to the apps. Uh, we're just sorting through uh, what the features are that I, you know, we think will be most valuable right. to uh, people who use the app. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I'm not a big fan of is cluttering an app mm -hmm. with uh, lots of features that people aren't going to use, making the experience just even that more difficult. Right. The app right now, you know, it's fairly simplistic, mm -hmm. um, but it, you know, it, it accomplishes the goal. And, and our, and again, right, the main right. focus is uh, having people quickly find mm -hmm. something to listen to, and then listen and have it all be reliable and not, you know, failing all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, when using the, uh, I think the one of your most recent iterations of the iOS app for iPhone, is that it now uses, uh, you know, backgrounding so that mm -hmm. you can. Sort of like you're using Pandora or, or uh, your iPod, mm -hmm. you can do other tasks and move around. And uh, have you had any reception on people commenting about these new features as they've come out? Yeah, I mean, there's there's pretty good feedback from the from the uh, users, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, some of it's great and useful. Some of it, um, you know, we take under consideration mm -hmm. and, and try to put in the future features, but. The, uh, the background feature, when that became available, we put that in right away, uh, like many uh, uh, app producers did. Mm -hmm. And that was obviously one of the biggest things because obviously people on smartphones are multitasking. Right. They want to go read their email. But <laughs> one of the biggest things, um, and it's not only with the smartphones, but just with people on their computers, is there's this whole concept of uh, background. They, they call this background their background music. Mm -hmm. So the people right. who love to listen to this stuff, it's it's their background. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the audience, uh, just say a quick word about the, you know, audience itself and the demographics of the audience. It's obviously a worldwide audience. Uh, the really interesting thing is how many people are just not pilots, how many mm -hmm. people are not involved in aviation at all. Uh, one of the biggest uh, parts of the audience is the, the nervous flyer, mm -hmm. uh, people who are you know timid about flying or very fearful of it. Mm -hmm. And they come here and they listen and many of them, and we've heard, we've got a lot of feedback from them, they just get the sense of, wow, you know, now I sort of understand a little bit better, even though right. I might not understand everything they're talking about, but I get the sense that there's some calm and that there's some, you know, order to, to right. all this chaos mm -hmm. of airplanes flying at each other in the air. Um, and it gives them actually more confidence to fly. So um, so that, that that was interesting. That, another unintended mm -hmm. consequence of having a website and having this stuff available. You're not actually the first aviation website or business person who shared the fact that non pilots, you know, get a they get a large frequency and chunk of people visiting who aren't pilots, just curious or enthusiasts, yep. uh, you know, people passionate about it but that aren't direct, necessarily directly involved. So that's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. 
Um, all right, well, before I uh, before we finish up here and uh, we tell folks how they can get in contact with you, are there any you know things we haven't touched on that you'd like to share with uh, with the viewers today? Yeah, I mean, I would say that, you know the biggest thing and the biggest um, amount of correspondence we get is you know why is such and such feed down? Mm -hmm. uh, be patient. Uh, we have okay. we one of the things that people aren't aware of probably is that we we have an automatic monitoring system. Mm -hmm. So when a feed goes down, the person providing the feed um, and and me if it's one of the many feeds that I provide is we know we know it's down. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things we don't know about is the feed might be up. But the audio disappeared. Right now, the scanner may have been knocked off. The power may have been knocked out of the scanner. The the audio cable may have been knocked out. Mm -hmm. There may be some other technical problem. Let us know about those. But if a feed's down, even if it's been down for five days, we know and we we go after the ones that are down and we try to get them back up. It's either you know working out a technical issue mm -hmm. or you know noting that the provider's on vacation and wanted everything to be turned off in the house. There are a variety of reasons, uh, but you know, try to hold back on the correspondence for feeds that are down because we know about it. Great. Uh, well, tell, uh, let's see, you've got, I noticed a Facebook page and a Twitter account. Uh, are there any other ways that viewers or listeners can get in contact with you or interact with you directly? Sure. I'm happy to hear from uh, anybody. We have a contact form on the website. Mm -hmm. uh, it's liveatc.net slash contact. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's usually the best way. Uh, helps me sort of you know track. It goes through a tracking system. It helps me track things. Um, uh, if you want to email me directly, uh, it's dave at liveatc.net. Okay. Uh, on Twitter, we're twitter.com slash liveatc and facebook.com slash liveatc. Great. Now, uh, I actually got a couple of comments while we were sitting here. Uh, one from, uh, actually, <laughs> Jay Talman, 1959, asks, uh, is this going to be archived? Yep, Jill, this is going to be uh, a site from the live broadcast that's recorded. And you'll find it available later on today on li um, thepilotreport.tv. Um, Buddy Martin down in Florida says he loved the mention of VAT SIM. Um, he, so many don't know about it and how it works, and he appreciates the fact that you shared that today. Yeah, VAT SIM's great. I, uh, you know, I was involved as a, a trainer actually for the Boston mm -hmm. uh, Center on VAT SIM. And, uh, not as active as uh, I would like to be, but we have a yearly event up here in Nashville that we do a fly-in. Actually, this very uh, midfield cafe is the uh, breakfast spot where we meet <laughs> before our virtual fly-in. Awesome! But, uh, but I love Vatsim. Vatsim's uh, been great, and I, I think if it weren't for that, there there really would have been no vehicle for me to be motivated to actually learn so much about air traffic mm -hmm. control mm -hmm. and to uh, you know we've actually one of the interesting things that people may not be aware of also is that. Uh, I've visited uh, numerous air traffic facilities, and especially the ones in this local area, and uh, the FAA actually uh, sort of loves what we're doing, um, and the mm -hmm. FAA safety uh, seminars, uh, especially the ones around communication, uh, Live ATC is mentioned in pretty much every one of those uh, presentations mm -hmm. telling pilots, you know, go back, listen to yourself, you know, critique the situation that mm -hmm. you may have been concerned about. Uh, but uh, there are um, there are just a number of uh, people, and it's a really small world through VATSIM and the FAA and uh, you know real world pilots like yourself. Um, the community is a lot smaller than people realize, right. and I keep running into people all over. <laughs> uh, yet you know with VATSIM, it's it's interesting. There are people who are like, oh yeah, VATSIM, and then there are people who you would think a absolutely would know about it, mm -hmm. have no idea what it is. Mm -hmm. And then I send them to the website, and you know, some of them actually become pilots or uh, controllers. Mm -hmm. uh, so th there's a lot of education happening in those virtual networks, mm -hmm. uh, and it's great stuff. Very cool. Uh, California Airport Home says, this is great. Loved it. <laughs> it sounds like they, they enjoyed watching us. And uh, I believe the last comment we had is from, I might mess this up, but it looks like it's Why Chalky on Twitter. Um, they said, always happy to listen to Dave talking about the great resource, great Android app, and they use it every day. So, great, um, great to hear it. Well, we, uh, we appreciate you guys tuning in today. I'm Len Costa with uh, thepilotreport.tv, Dave Pasco with liveatc.net, live from uh, the Midfield Cafe, Nashua, New Hampshire. We appreciate you sitting down with us this morning for this virtual breakfast. Love to hear your thoughts on how this interview worked out, if you enjoyed tuning in with us this morning. and. Uh, we look forward to talking to you guys again, everybody. We wish you clear skies and calm winds. Take care.
Bye. Bye.